I begin by praising the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mightiest, the greatest, the compassionate. I seek the abundant salutations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Sayyid Abu Sayyid Abu Abdi, Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam, and all the other prophets, Ali sallallahu wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless our presence in this blessed place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our gathering a mean of attaining his pleasure, nearness, and forgiveness. May Allah include our names in the list of those who are chosen in the sight of Allah. <coughs> and may he benefit to me first and foremost and all of us present here with these discussions and discourses that we are to take part and to participate in. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. The knowledge of Deen is uniquely different than all the other sciences. Because when it comes to knowledge, especially in this day and age, pretty much due to the professional world, everything and anything has become educational. So much so a person who just wants to be a barber in his life needs to go through a session and training and learning. Alhamdulillah is the good side of it. So in the midst of the ocean of education, and different faculties of knowledge. The Islamic knowledge stands out to be very different, not like any other science. And to qualify the statement, I would quote what I said yesterday, that to Muslims, this is the most noble science because it introduces Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator to us and the rest of what I have enumerated some of the virtues. When the science itself is so noble and so great, so anyone who would embody himself or herself equipped with this knowledge would also at autom automatically would become very noble in the sight of Allah. And because what we are going to perceive with respect to this book or any other science in this intensive is all about the religious knowledge. Therefore, what we also need to remember is the fact that as the knowledge itself is so sacred, so blessed, therefore there has been well, there has been defined very well the adequates and adab and the importance of it in order 
for us to realize how great this is if a person who avoids himself from following those adab and etiquettes, simply he is wasting his time. That knowledge will not be fruitful and beneficial to him. And you will see in a minute as I will share with you one of the citations from the author. One of the very reasons that led him, inspired him to compose this work was that this is why Allah al Din al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala in Tazkir al-Sami'i ibn Tukallim here he mentions an example that Islam has a hallmark and that is knowledge and muqawwibat walakum muqawwibat he says and there are essentials to that that would help a person attain that hallmark and he says that the essentials and fundamentals or the foundation of that knowledge is the adab, is the adab and etiquette. If the foundation is missing, then the rest will not be able to be attained. And then he goes on to explaining, second, that let me give you an example. I'm quoting his words. Imagine a city, and that city has five castles, fortresses, one made out of gold, second silver, <coughs> and the third iron, fourth, you know, brick, and baked, and the fifth one baked, you know, baked clay. Fajr eleven, <coughs> and there is a fossil. There is a boundary that guards the city surrounding it, these castles and palaces. And part of the reason it is all there to protect the place and the people. He says that the last of the castles, which is, for instance, the brick one, which is the nearest to the fossil, the boundary wall, you know, for it in order to retain and, and intact and protect it, there are guards. So, and those guards, if they are well equipped with the equipment and are able to defend and protect that castle, the enemies who have invaded or intend to invade will not be able to penetrate through. Get to the most expensive one, the precious one, which is the castle made out of gold. If they pass through this, and if they succeed in their invasion, then slowly but, sh but surely, all one by one, they will lose. He uses this metaphorical example, and now he applies that with Islam, to Islam. And then he says that Islam also has pretty much the same five, you know, things that fortify it, protect it. And what are they? As he mentions, number one, you know, Iman, Yaqeen basically. And number two, Ikhlas. And number three, Adaul Fara'i, fulfilling the obligations. And number four, Adaul Sunan, fulfillment of the Sunan. And number five is Hifqul Adab. He says these are the four fortifying sources for Islam. The Yaqeen, Al Ikhlas, Adab al Faraid, Adab al Sunan, and last but not least, Hifqul Adab. The preservation of courtesy and mannerism and etiquette in Islam. And then he further goes on to explaining. Shaytan, his aim is not to deprive us of adab. His aim is to deprive us of the greatest thing, which is iman. He will not be able to attack directly. Listen to this and pay attention. Try to marvel his 
depth what you try to explain this. Shaitan's aim is not really to deprive us of the etiquette. His aim and objective is to deprive a woman with his religious identity, which is Iman. He would not be able to get to it unless he works through slowly but surely through these things. So if he succeeds in, in, in depriving a person of the, the importance of education in his life, he has succeeded for a big time. Then he would move, move on to the next one. Then the next one. And finally he would achieve his goal. In, through this example, what he wants us to realize the greatness and gravity and, and importance of preservation of adab. So someone who is really protecting the adab in his life, will he allow shaitan to really attack his faith? No. Because, he, because the, the castle of faith is too far at this moment. So he has defeated shaitan right at the first attempt. So subhanAllah, it is really one of the very beautiful examples that have come across to appreciate the concept of Adab and Islam. So therefore, when, when it comes to seeking Islamic knowledge, you know, as Sheikh Hamza in, in his forward has mentioned that Islamic community is the only one that has really rooted itself in the concept of Adab. And this is much more than simple mannerism. You know, it, as I, if you look at the word Adab, in, in one of the connotations is that Tahdeeb. It means the advanced development of the person's mind and self. The advanced development. That is what the Adab, adab is all about. It's not simply just you know, having cheerful personality or smiling by looking at someone, etc. It is an advanced development of the mind and personality. So, and seeking Islamic knowledge definitely will do that to a person provided he or she remains focused on this. And therefore, it is imperative for us to really, or for any serious and sincere seeker of knowledge of me, before he embarks on the journey, to read this book and understand fully and equip himself or herself with the very fundamentals that he, the author has mentioned in this book. Inshallah, through that they will be able to you know, really make their end very fruitful and very benefiting to them. So, and this book, which is, uh, you know, is not one of the very rare books in this science. If you look at the, the classical works in the rich history of Islamic sciences, there has been literally a devoted and dedicated science and books to this particular subject. There are many. I will mention a few names to you so that you know that in the past, scholars used to really take this very seriously and therefore they would write books and teach the students prior to teaching them anything else. Among the very known and great books on this subject is this book that I have with me also, alhamdulillah, this is called Tadkir al-Sami' al-Mutakallim fi adab al-Alim wa al written by one of the great Shafi'i scholars. And there is another book, it's called Adab al-Ulama wal Mutaallimin by Sheikh Hussain ibn Mansur, Yemen. And there is another one written by a very famous scholar of the 6th, 5th and 6th century, Allama ibn Abdul Baq, Maliki rahmanullah ta'ala. And his book is known as Jami Rubayani al Ilm wa Fadlihi. Jami Rubayani al Ilm wa Fadlihi. There is another great scholar who has written something very similar to this of the very same era, Sheikh Khatib al Baghdadi, and his book is called Tazkir al Sam. His book is called Al Jami al Akhlaqi. 
Jami' al Akhlaq, Lil Alim wa Mutaalim, something of this title. And there are many, the list goes on. I just mentioned a few names to you so that you recognize and understand that in earlier centuries of Islam, the scholars of Sharia, they used to pay special attention to this. And here we are, alhamdulillah, marveling their work and studying one of the books of this time. I hope and pray that we really take it seriously, inshallah. The knowledge that we learn, we impart, and we make it part of our educational career. <coughs> With this said, now moving on to the book itself, a brief introduction that I wanted to share with you about the author and the book. Because if we do not know about the author and the book, oftentimes we may underestimate the importance of the subject itself. Because the great personalities also define the great work. So, as far as the author is concerned, he is from the 6th century Hijri Islam. in between 5th and 6th, I should say. And his name, as he has a title, and the title is Burhan al or Burhan al-Islam, which means that the proof of Islam or the proof of Deen. And he wrote, wrote this book when he was what is called today the modern Turkey. He was in one of the madrasa in Turkey teaching the students. And when he looked at the conditions of his, his students, that they are not able to succeed in their career. In other words, they are graduating, but not being so productive and so beneficial to themselves and to the communities. So he reflected very deeply at it, and he was very troubled by that. And then he started to write this book, this book as a result, so that they could learn something from it. And then, subhanAllah, my goodness, when he looked at that almost a thousand years ago, he would, when he would look at the Muslim students and the conditions of the Muslim students today, subhanAllah, he might even refuse to teach them. This is how that we have gone too far away from it. So he belongs to a place it's called Zarnuj, a well-known town beyond the river Oxus, you know, Mawala Unnah. This is referred to as Mawala Unnah in the fifth. And it is in the present day Turkestan, in the Central Asia. And he was honored with this title of Burhan al-Din and Burhan al-Islam because of his high rank in the Ulum Sharia. His actual name was an numan ibn Ibrahim. He studied with many great shiuk, one of the very luminaries of his time, and he often quotes in this book is Allah Marghinani, Burhan al-Din Marghinani, rahimahullah, who was the author who is the author of Al-Hidayah, the very famous Hanafi classical text. And this is some of the very brief introductory remarks about his personal life. With respect to the book, you know, he wrote this treatise and named it as Ta'aleem al-Muta'allim wa Tariq al-Ta'allim, instruction to the student and the method of learning. So in, in this book, he is trying to explain that what is the proper method of learning and what are the instructions that a student need to take seriously if they are serious in their efforts, in, the, in seeking their knowledge, in their knowledge. And this book has been recognized widely throughout centuries ever since it was written, written and 
scholars have complimented, com you know, commented, and recommended the students, and even taught in Madaris, many traditional you know, Islamic seminaries, these books used to be taught in the past. And that shows the acceptance of the work itself, that mashallah, because of his sincerity, you know, was really such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his work and it, made, it became popular. And even, as I said, today we are sitting here studying this book after centuries that, has, that have passed away, that have passed from since that time. One of the things that he mentions, that the reason that led me to write this book, that I notice in our day, many students of knowledge striving to attain ilm, but failing to do so, and are barred from its fruits. This is because they have neglected the proper method of learning and have abandoned its conditions. And anyone who misses his direct the direction, and even who misses the direction of the journey, he says, loses the destination. Well said. He said, anyone who misses the direction to the, for the journey, then would lose the destination. And as a result, their efforts would be, that they are making tirelessly would become meaningless. So this is what he mentioned that led, led him to compose this book. Now I want to come on to come to the book itself. Did anyone read any of the chapters for today? Anyone? You did mention. Anyone else? Come on. Try to read beforehand before you attend the class, inshallah. This is how it is. One of the things that he mentions in the book is there is that the student before coming to the class should go over the lesson and try to understand on his or her own and if they are not able to then they mark the area that they don't understand and they have under, they did not understand those areas that they should under, underline and then they could ask the scholar the teacher the instructor in the class <coughs> First chapter, I mean this book has 12 chapters in total. The first one is Mahiyat al ilm wal fiqh wa fadlihi. I'm going to summarize what he attempted to explain in this chapter. Shall we go over at least two today? Anyone who would read this chapter carefully would be able to easily extract eight or nine points, which would, I can say, summarize this chapter. And they are as follows. The author, Rahimahullah, starts his work with citation of the hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Talab al-ilmi fariyadatan ala kulli muslimin wa muslima that the quest for knowledge is incumbent upon every Muslim, be it a male or female. In light of that, there are some number of questions that pop up in mind, might also come in your, come in your mind as well. That there is also another hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, اُطْلُبُ الْعِلْمِ مِنَ الْمَهْدِ إِلَى الْلَحْدِ So the first point is that seeking knowledge is a religious duty for a Muslim. Seeking knowledge is a religious obligation because without it we will not be able to traverse our religious journey. 
like I mentioned and explained yesterday, that Islam means submission. And how do we submit? We need to know. We need to learn. So therefore, the, pro the proper and complete definition would be that the, for, the word of, the, for the word of Islam is submission to the will of Allah through knowledge, proper knowledge. So, and that, it starts with the intellectual submission first, because before I submit physically, I, my mind needs to submit to the knowledge. If it, if it accepts and digests, then it will motivate me personally and physically to follow it. Therefore, number one obligation, or the first point, what we learn from this is seeking knowledge is, is a religious obligation. Number two is the second hadith that I shared with you. Prophet ﷺ said, Seek knowledge right from the time that you know you come to this world. And all the way till even lahat, a person dies, passes away. So the process of learning is starts right from the time a person comes to this world. Therefore they say, you know, in, 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 in philosophy, in some other sciences that the, the very reason that children are able to grasp knowledge very quicker, very quick and faster than any other person at any age is because of their high end potentials for learning. Because if you want to study any language, it will take you years to master that. But how, how is it that children are able to you know, catch quickly and grasp things quickly because of their what would be with the capacity? So this hadith of Rasulullah confirms and proves that seeking knowledge as it is an obligation, this is the second point, that, but it is a lifelong commitment. It is not just for, us, for a certain period of time. Because he mentioned very clearly that it's to start right from the beginning of your life and should end with your life. So this is, this is the second point to note. It should go, this should be part of our daily routine, literally. And part of the reason that I often say that SubhanAllah, have you ever thought of this fact that why is it that in our daily prayers, we are required to read a portion of Quran daily. There could have been something else. You know, it could have been some du'as. Part of the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala required that because it is to motivate us about the reading and learning. So that we motivate ourselves when, when, when a person, you know, wants to pray, needs to memorize Quran and needs to master to some degree the science of Tajweed and the rest. And plus, by reading daily, he or she is to motivate himself and herself to seek more and more knowledge. But when they are reading, they should think, "What I need to know what I read. So it is an ongoing journey. There are many people, they have prayed their whole life, never bothered to even learn the basic meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha. At least, at least let me try what, what does this Surah you know, is, is all about. So there are many reasons, but this is one of the reasons. That, so it is a motivation that a person should get out of it. Anyhow, this is the second point. And the third one is, is seeking all sciences of Islam an obligation? This is what the author you know, has attempted to explain here. Of course not. So the second point that he is trying to explain is that it is not a requirement from regular Muslims to seek all Sharia sh knowledge, all Islamic sciences, because it is beyond the capacity and need for human, for every Muslim. Then what is required for them in their life is something that relates to their mundane and daily life in terms of religion. 
For instance, you know, every Muslim, aqil and ghalib, must make an effort to study the chapter on purity. Because that is relevant to them every day in their life. And he says, in, not all of the sciences of Sharia are required to be learned, rather selective sciences. And even then, in, within that selection, there is further selection. What is it that what relates to us daily would be prioritized as first thing to learn? And what comes second would be the second. What comes third, that would be the third. So you see, there are two things here. One is that we need first and foremost to know that I don't need to study in depth all the sciences like tafsir and hadith and usul al-fiqh and usul al-hadith and usul al-tafsir, all of that. Rather, I need to choose those relevant sciences that are related to my daily life. And second, what is the most needed would be given the most the, the, would be given the precedence. That must be the first thing to learn. And then what comes the second would be the second. And the rest goes on accordingly. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Therefore, as I mentioned, Kitab al Tahara will be number one. And then Kitab, because if you look at any book of fiqh in general, this has been the, the, the tradition that any book of fiqh in general starts with Kitab al Tahara. Why is that? Because a person who becomes Muslim, for instance, today, and now it is a prayer time. Let's say Zuhur. If it's Zuhur Salah time, then before he could go or she could go to pray, what they need to know is, you know, the ahkam of Tahara, because we know that there is a requirement for a person to go through certain washing. Maybe he or she needs to wash the face and the rest. So therefore, Kitab al Tahara has always been, in general, the first chapter to be discussed in the books of Fiqh. Before Kitab al Salah, though Kitab al Salah is more important than that because Salah is the second most important prayer after the Shahada. But prayer cannot be possible without Tahara. Therefore, they used to discuss first Kitab al Tahara and then Kitab al Salah. So, Kitab al Tahara number one, and then we should focus on Kitab al uh, uh, Salah. And the third would be, you know, Kitab al Siyam, Ahkam al Siyam, the rules and regulations relating to the fast. Fasting. And then, if a person is rich and wealthy, then should study the chapter on zakat. Because it is not related to, for example, if I'm poor, then I don't need to give that science an extreme importance that I have to study today because something that not, does not relate to me immediately, then I should postpone it. As it is good to study always. However, I, if I have not studied yet Kitab al Tahara and Salat and the rest, then I don't need to study Kitab al Zakat because it is not related to me. In the past, the scholars, subhanAllah, one of the great scholars from the Indian subcontinent, he was the student of one of the great scholars. He mentioned in his autobiography that when I used to study at the hands of my Shaykh, he taught us Kitab al Salat and Kitab al Siyam, and he paused and he said, We will study the next subject after we finish two or three things. He said, Number one, after we master this, these two, three the chapters that we have studied, after we have, after we have understood that fully, we need to now implement, put into practice. And third, when we become rich, we will study that. So they used to go by the need of the day. So therefore he says, this is how the order should be. And if a person is rich, now then he should study Kitab al-Hajj, and on and on. If a person is married, it is extremely crucial and pertinent that they study Kitab al-Nikah and Kitab al-Talaq likewise. How many people today, they really make an effort you know, when it comes to marriage? If they are about to marry, they think it's a dream world. So it's a, subhanAllah, it's the world of romance and love and the rest. But they don't think of the realities of life. And therefore, look at the, the rate of divorce today. In Islam, it is equally important that before we get on this journey, we should really study the ahkam and ahkam. 
you derive some obligation the rest. When we do not know, then when we run into trouble, the only solution we find is to separate. But there are ample guidance in that regard and solutions have been studied, we will have known, oh, this is how, this is what I studied, so I need to find a solution in this, this way. But since we don't know, we did not study, therefore we run into troubles, and when we run into troubles, then we, instead of finding the right solution, we find that more, we, we create more problems to ourselves. So Kitab al-Nikah, Kitab al and the rest, all of these things are relevant to our life that must be studied accordingly. So that is another point that the, the scholar has mentioned here. And the next one is the nobility of learning. He mentioned something very interesting here, and that is He says that the fadlul ilm, the nobility of knowledge is known to human. In general, people recognize the importance of it. Seeking knowledge is a really important thing, especially in this day and age, age of education, as I mentioned yesterday, information and education. However, what we might not, might not have thought this way, what he says, there are certain traits and qualities that are common between humans and animals. For example, courage, valor, bravery, and compassion, and generosity. All of these things, he says that, you know, there are commonalities between us and other makhluqat, creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But knowledge stands out to be very unique that is exclusively associated with human life. And it is this that had set the fadilat, the greatness of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam over the malaika. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, as you know those ayat, is qala qubla al-malaika bin al-ja'il al And then and the discourse between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels is such, you know, they said at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, illa ma'allamtan, innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allah, we don't have any knowledge other than what you have given to us. Therefore, we do not know your purpose behind creating this another makhluk, human being. So they simply said, the knowledge belongs to you, O Allah alone. So that knowledge that was given to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, the point the scholars and the Sirun, Allah Ta'ala, tried to highlight here that the knowledge that was given to Adam والسلام, was not even given to the Malaika, let alone other Makhluqat of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Therefore, that sets a precedence, precedence and fazilat of human over all of the other Makhluqat, even in the light of this, uh, this ayat and tafsir, even over the Malaika and angels. So therefore he says, this is something that is to be appreciated, that is to be appreciated. And it is this knowledge, he says further, that indeed teaches humans to be muttaqi, to have God consciousness, the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is this sign, it is ilm that will lead them to really fear Allah and to be conscious of Him and to remain mindful of Him in their, in their lives. And he further goes on to mentioning some of the virtues of the knowledge. He said, or the author says that it is the knowledge that makes a person or enables a person to learn the good traits and sifat and to adorn his or her life with that, and to also know the evil traits and evil qualities such as pride, such as jealousy, such as <coughs> hatred, and the rest. And when we know, then it should help us also to avoid that. So these are some of the benefits and virtues of knowledge, he says. Knowledge, number one, helps us to recognize our Creator and to get closer to Him. Number two, to know the, the beneficial things 
the things that benefit us. Number three, the things that harm us, that destroy our well-being. All of these things are related to that. So the next point, which is number five, is the legal status of seeking knowledge. Islamic knowledge. As for learning, the rules that apply to situations that arise only in certain occasions, then that is seen as a fadl kifayah, a collective obligation. It's not fadl ayn. Like in the, like previously, as I mentioned, that kitab al tahara, kitab al salat, and all of these things. That, to learn these things, because anything that is fawd, ain, like prayer is fawd, ain, and uh, siyam, depending on the person, is fawd, fawd, ain, and also zakat. Anything that becomes fawd, ain for the person, it is also fawd, ain for him to learn about that, to know about it. And something that is not fawd, ain, fawd, kifaya, then if there are few people in the community who learn, who master that, that would suffice. And if there is no one who has mastered that science and that knowledge, then as Fuqaha have mentioned, then the entire community will be deemed guilty in the sight of Allah because of ne neglecting a com communal and collective obligation. I will answer at the end if you have any question. Please keep it to, to the end. And what I, what I mean by fardain to learn is the basics of every science that is fault for us to carry out. Obviously not in depth. In depth knowledge is related to the scholars and those who have mastered the rest. For example, every person who prays must know the faraiz of salat. What are the faraiz of salat? If someone doesn't know, then he is sinning indefinitely. But it doesn't mean that prayer, if they have prayed correctly, will not be doesn't mean that it will be invalid. It will be valid. But if they have not learned those basics, then they have ignored the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a different sin that they have committed. And then he mentions that the example of the knowledge of Fardha'in and Fardha Kifa is that, that the knowledge of Fardha'in is like a food to your body, to your body. Or the, or the what? or as we know, the water is vital to human life, something that we cannot survive without. So something that is absolute and necessary, it is to be seen as the food to our survival. And something that is not that, then he says, the example of that is like a medicine that we have to take, but only when we become sick. So, we, so accordingly, we, we have to treat that. When it comes to knowledge, this is the next point, number six. As we know that there are a lot of beneficial sources of ilm. On the other hand, especially in this day and age, without a doubt, you, you all know and agree, would agree with me that there are a lot of sciences today in terms of morality, ethics, religiosity, you know, are absolutely detrimental to human well-being, spiritual, moral, and religious. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. So, we have to recognize that not every ilm is beneficial to human. And in this day and age, it is very true that much of what we learn is the junk knowledge. Things that are absolutely not related to us or, of, or have no benefit to us. And especially in this society, with due respect to the goodness of the society, but like for example, one of the scholars mentioned that, you know, we have junk information, and we consume junk food and we involve the activities that are also kind of you know junk in nature then he says that that we have become like a junkyard you know what goes in what that comes out therefore you see people they are engaged in dialogue that are absolutely nonsense part of the reason because they are involved in engrossing the activities and things that they have that they really have affected their mind so we need to make sure filtered through Things that are we only allow because you, you have to appreciate one of the things that you will mention here 
in the next, I think, could be subject. Appreciate the intellect. Allah has him. Really think about the great signal, the bounty of Allah. Intellect. It is all about this. There is a hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after creating humans, asked the angel, what is the best thing that I have created in him? After creating Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the angels. They said, Allah Allah knows the best. Allah said it is a aql in him, not the body or the strength. It is his aql that is the greatest that I have created in him. And Allah said, it is through that aql I will be recognized. It is, it is through that intellect I will be worshipped. It is through that intellect I will be obeyed. So in our body, this is the most precious thing that we have. But when we expose our intellect to the, the things that are very harmful, don't think that they have no, they have, don't think they have no impact. Anything and everything that you see, you hear, there is an effect on your brain. Even, even the modern science has proven that. So therefore, why do you think Islam has really encouraged and, and, and promoted this concept that you need to preserve your eyes, your, your hearing and the rest? Why? Because these are the filters. Through this, our heart will be affected. They are the doors to our heart. And Muqazal has extensively talked about this. These are the doors to our heart because our heart is inside. But eyes and hearing and the rest, they will affect our heart. What we do, what we use, what we touch. So therefore, he may, now he mentions that one of the sciences that are, you know, that have negative effect on human brain and life and religion is astrology. What is also known as the horoscope. I mean, studying it is different than also studying for the sake of believing the effect of the stars in, on the life of people or the events of the, in, of the world. There are two different things. If someone is studying, he's, you know, he's a waste of time because in Islam we believe, Rasul said, A person who has, who has studied a portion of astrology with that intention as if he has taken a portion of magic in his life. And, and whatever time he has devoted for that purpose is not going to be meaningful. But if someone studies that and also believes in that, then that is, is absolutely against our Islam because we believe the, the, the effect of even anything that is to be there is all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is by the taqdeer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man amana bin nujum, faqad kafara bin dai subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned that whoever has faith in the effect of the stars has definitely rejected the taqdeer and the, uh, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the signs that he mentions that, that are harmful to human, uh, to, to, uh, Muslim, uh, to the religion. And then he goes on to mention number seven is that the, the, some of the beneficial sciences to human society and human lives and the rest is al-tib, the medicine. So now you might notice that he is not speaking of the religious sciences because he is giving a broader context for ilm itself. You know, anything that benefits as at the end he concludes with that, you know, humans should have concern for that and have interest in that because human societies thrive and flourish this way. You know, there has to be expert of, experts of uh, in, in individuals who are expert in every field that make the, the society pro you know, progress and flourish in the rest. So medicine is equally important because it deals and with human life and treats the diseases. And in fact, he quotes also here the maqula of Imam Shafi ta'ala. Imam Shafi ta'ala is devoted to have said al-ilm iman The science is of two branches. It has two branches. Primarily, it is divided and classified as, as two types. One, ilm, you know, ilm al-fiqh, the, the knowledge of fiqh, which relates to the religious activities of people. Lil adiyan. And the second one he says, ilm al tib the medicine. And that deals with the human life. And he says this is basically the summation of all sciences with, that are fruitful and productive and beneficial to human life. And beyond that, it is just the you know sub uh, segments of these two sciences. And number eight point is that 
because he touched briefly on fiqh, and it, in fact you will see in this book because he himself was a jurist and studied at the hands of great jurists, so he makes reference to ilm fiqh as one of the great sciences, and a person should really uh, devote his or her time to it and, and possibly master that science, etc. So now he, uh, in, the, in number eight point, he defined the fiqh. What is fiqh? He says, Ma'rifat al daqaiq al ilm. It is the science of the fine points of every knowledge, basically. Inshallah, I'm going to go over some of the remarks about fiqh. I will mention more, uh, inshallah, when I speak of that. But Ma'rifat al daqaiq al ilm. This is the definition that he mentioned in his book. It is the knowledge of the intricate and the subtle points of every knowledge that is very deeply rooted into it you don't see on the, at the surface you have to dive into the science then you'll be able to extract those pearls of wisdom and last but not least at the end he says you know a person who is interested in seeking knowledge must never be heedless of his soul and the conditions of his soul and whatever benefits or harm it, he has to be aware of that and constantly re should remain vigilant about that. And should engage in the types of sciences that are productive and fruitful and avoid things that, are ha that harm human beings. And with respect to especially the religious and the spiritual sciences. So this is the first chapter and these are the points that I have tried to summarize. We conclude with this because uh, the time is also up at this fast. Jazakumullah khairan. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except what has been said, if there is khair, it's for Allah. And if there was any error, it was for me. It was in Shaytan and Allah. Subhanallah, the enemy is kind of a long period. I'm sure that I have been done. Don't stop it. Yes, you had any question? Shaykh, just like you mentioned that there's Any science that does not relate to day-to-day -day life, like in, in, in fiqh, there are obviously clearly well defined these things. One of the things that the Qadi had mentioned, Salat al Janazah itself is fadla kifaya. It's a communal obligation, as you know. So to learn the ahkam of Salat al Janazah would be seen as also a, a collective responsibility. A few people know that, who are able to leave Salat al Janazah, are able to facilitate that uh, situation. That would be seen as for the Similarly, other things with relates to that relates to, uh, to like for example, modern economy. There has to be people who have to master that science to be able to uh, give the right direction and channel to the uh, financing system. That is another thing, thing that is seen as for the and other things as well. Any other question? It's not about the sixth century when, when Islam had expanded to other territories, other con continent, you know, it was exposed to a variety of challenges because you know when Islam reached to Europe and far east and other areas. So the sciences of those regions also it started to you know, Muslims were exposed to that. And you know one, one of the things that Islam paid a lot of attention to, uh, the scholars of Islam I should say, like Imam Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Rushd and others, you know, to philosophy. Because Islam reached far and wide, you know, philosophical theories started attacking the roots of Islam. So there had to be scholars to study that and to approve that and to tackle that situation. So 
in India, it was very, even to this date, it is very, very, and it's the same thing in China. And Chinese are, they really, uh, are, uh, they really look up to this science as a very, something very sacred, I don't know, but it's something that they are, have seen very common among them. So Asian and East Asian countries, when Islam reached that region, people who accepted Islam, they did not know whether or not it is acceptable in Islam to really practice that or to believe in it. So people of that region basically are being addressed because he himself is part of that country, you know, those areas, not from the really Arab countries. Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala. Shall now we will start fiqh. How many students are here to study fiqh Hanafi? One, anyone else? Shall I think that if it's okay with you, Chef, what we'll do is um, maybe take 